33. Confession and Collection One of the more baffling texts of Scripture is found in Malachi 3, 8-12. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all the nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. What is baffling about this text is that something so obvious and a promise so clear should be routinely overlooked and neglected by professing Christians. Tithing and going above and beyond the tithe is a form of confession. We confess that the Lord is sovereign and that he is the landlord over all creation. Psalm 24, 1 We therefore give him his due when we tithe and we confess his lordship. When we fail to tithe, we rob him. St. Paul, in summoning believers to give for special collections, did so because of his awareness that salvation comes to men only as a free gift of the grace of God. Our Lord says, Freely ye have received, freely give. Matthew 10, 8. Paul took up a special collection for the poor. Galatians 2, 10. He had no hesitancy in doing so because it was for him an important expression of the fact that we are members one of another. Ephesians 4.25 the Mosaic Law is full of requirements that covenant members help fellow believers in need. The Church, as the new Israel of God, Galatians 6.16, 6, has this same obligation. To help one another and to tie to the Lord is thus a means of confession, of confessing Christ. In Judaism, voluntary contributions were also gathered for scholars. In the medieval and Reformation era, scholars were supported by Christians as a necessary ministry. In Ephesians 4.11, pastors and teachers, or scholars, are placed together. According to Nicol, the collection had a theological significance for Paul. First, it expressed and put into practice Christian charity. Paul was here thinking of gifts above and over the tithe. Second, such gifts for diaconal mercies express Christian unity. Third, it represented, quote, the anticipation of Christian eschatology, end quote. Christ is, for the Christian, the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, 1 Timothy 6.15. By means of our giving, Christians command the various spheres of life, worship, health, education, welfare and more. We witness thereby to Christ's Lordship, his dominion and sovereignty over all spheres of life and thought. To tithe and to give more than the tithe is to confess Christ as Lord. Failure to tithe and give is a confession of sin, of a disregard for God's claim on us. Quote, it was characteristic that at the common meals of the community during which the most intense liturgical service was rendered to Christ in the celebration of the Lord's Supper, the provision for the needs of the poor occupied an essential place. It was simply a broadening of this function within a Christian community to extend the charitable relief from one Christian community to another, which resulted in the application of the term service to a monetary collection. End quote. Thus, the collection of money was not only a part of worship, but it was also a confession of faith and of community. A worshipper's giving is thus an act of faith and an expression of grace. The early church, by obeying God's law in this respect, confessed and declared itself to be the true Israel of God. Galatians 6.16 
Romans 9, 6 following, 11, 5, 17 following, 1 Corinthians 10, 18, Galatians 3, 7, 4, 28, Philippians 3, 3, etc. The collection witnesses to the presence of God's kingdom on earth and to its necessary rule, not only the church collection, but also all giving to Christian ministries is an expression of that faith. Thus, when Paul took the relief money to Jerusalem, collected from Gentile churches, he took with him men from these Gentile churches. Acts chapter 21 verse 16 This was a witness to Jerusalem that the church was now the true Israel of God, into which all the nations would come. Thus, Paul's arrival in Jerusalem was a mighty witness to an eschatological fact. It declared that the fulfilment was coming only in Christ. It is no wonder that Paul's arrest followed. His act of charity was a confession of faith that the fulfilment of all the prophecies of old are in Jesus Christ and him alone. This was a direct contradiction of the hope and faith of the Pharisees. Not surprisingly, many dispensationalists who are antinomian and do not tithe see God's love of the Jews as unconditional. Hence, there is for them no dominion mandate, no law, no belief that Christ's kingdom will prevail in history. It will for them come only through old Israel. For the logical dispensationalist, tithing is no longer necessary, and in rejecting the requirement of the tithe, Dispensationalists unconsciously confess a hope in the Pharisees' Messiah, not in Jesus Christ as King and Lord. Giving thus to the Church and to various Christian ministries is a confession of faith. When we tithe and when we give above and over the tithe, we confess that Christ as King requires our taxes in order to establish His dominion in and through us. The offering is therefore a confession of faith. It is an admission that we and all that we have are God's property. Many of the offertory responses state this. A familiar one is, All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee. Amen. Another by John Greenleaf Whittier, 1807-1892, declares, All things are thine. No gifts have we, Lord of all gifts, to offer thee, and hence with grateful hearts today, thine own before thy feet we lay. Another, by the Reverend Samuel Longfellow, 1886, confesses thus Bless thou the gifts our hands have brought, bless thou the work our hearts have planned. Ours is the faith, the will, the thought, the rest, O God, is in thy hand. Perhaps most familiar is the offertory response written by Bishop W. Walsam Howe, 1864. We give thee but thine own, whate'er the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. Various communions have other offertory responses. Let us consider for a moment the meaning of that familiar term, offertory responses. These are all brief hymns of thanks to the Lord for the privilege of giving and of being members of his kingdom of grace. This is an unusual and remarkable fact. No sane man sings a hymn of thanks as he posts or delivers his tax payment to the Federal Internal Revenue Service. Perhaps that agency would itself call the police if someone burst into a grateful song and delivering his tax money, and rightly so. Christians, however, commonly sing as their offerings are presented. More, they usually stand and sing. Now, in our time, as often before, this has become no more than a thoughtless ritual and its meaning is forgotten or neglected. However, not only are hymns a confession, often of both sin and of God's grace, but so too is the offertory. We cannot limit it to the offering in the church, but must see all giving to Christian ministries in any and every field as a form of confession. If we give primarily to ourselves, we confess thereby that we are our own gods, Genesis 3.5. 
If we give perfunctorily to the church, we can thereby show that we are mindful of the forms and are keeping a toe in Christ's house. If we tithe and give above and over a tithe, and if we give wisely to those ministries best serving Christ in his kingdom, we then make a good confession.